Welcome back to the School of Muscle. Today, I'm really excited to release this podcast for you guys. I had on Steve Hall. He is founder of Revive Stronger. He's a podcast host, and he was involved in a very like serious accident a while back, and this is where he fell in love with lifting weights. And man, this guy has been lifting some weights, and he has turned this love into a passion of helping others, helping other people. He's he's worked with competitive athletes and just regular, everyday people looking to you know build muscle, lose fat, and that sort of thing. He's a really, really helpful guy. In this episode, he shares a ton of quality information. We discuss how to manage your training volume, when when to do more, when to do less. We we discuss when it might be a good time to like do a resensitization phase or a, a primer phase. We discuss how to manage holidays and things like that. We discuss how bodybuilding or lifting weights has really benefited Steve's life. We discuss a lot of quality information in this episode, and I really hope you guys enjoy this. So without further ado, we've got Big Steve. All right, Steve, so the first kind of topic that I want to discuss with you here is like there's there tends to be kind of two different camps when, when thinking about programming volume throughout like a mesocycle, and there's kind of one camp that thinks that, you know, maybe you just have a more static approach, have a pretty even levels of volume throughout, and then there's another camp that thinks it's a pretty good idea to like increase volume week by week by week. So I'd be interested in your experience with, you know, using both of them, why, why you kind of program the way you do now, what benefits you think are like that. And if you think that that has any more of a benefit from like other ways of programming of with more static volume and things like that. Cool. So first of all, I just want to say it's an absolute honor to be on the podcast and one of the early guests. And I want to tell anyone who's listening um, who doesn't maybe know that much about Ryan, that Ryan is the absolute man. Uh, he's been <laughs> helping us out at Revive Stronger for a, a good period of time, never, ever lets us down. He is someone who is up and coming in the industry. And if you're thinking about whether or not he's someone you should be following or kind of taking information from, I would guarantee he's a good person too. So I just want to say that because Ryan has helped us out more than probably he realizes so. Steve, you're making me blush here, man. <laughs> that, that means a lot, now, though. I, I really appreciate that. Now I can go to the question. Um, yeah. I just want—I just had to say it because it's true. So, yeah, w- I've certainly had experience on both ends. So I've I've programmed via just increasing intensities and kind of using triple progression, or well, I suppose that has set ranges in it and double progression. I've used percentage-based uh, things, and that was very much where my early coaching and training career stood. Uh, that's where I used to um, go about things from reading stuff like practical programming from Mark Ripito. A lot of the stuff from 3DMJ, especially the earlier stuff, was more so based around that. And I know they took a lot of influence from practical programming, uh, which is a good book. Um, but a lot of that stuff was taken from programming and ways of doing things that was much so focus on strength, um, which intensity is the prime driver for getting strong. I don't think anyone ever argues or disputes that. Whereas for hypertrophy, people seem to get in an argument and a tiff about stuff that I think actually everyone tends to agree on in that you need to have a given threshold of intensity and then more volume than you you can do and recover from tends to provide better results. Um, That sentence seems very simplistic, is incredibly kind of complex and lots of people don't realize that even kind of I've had many clients come to me and we've had to revamp things even though they're effectively following principle-based programming they're very well educated and we just have to strip things back so yeah a lot of my early programming was based around that linear progression um, of just kind of adding weight where I could over time and um, I had some ideas of kind of RPEs, but they were just focused around basically eight to ten mostly pushing hard a lot of the time And what I found really difficult in that approach was actually improving. And I kind of would just kind of be almost training up here and then being like, where do I go from here? And once you're kind of that intermediate level, it's just very hard to just go and just where you don't really leave room to progress. So discovering kind of Mike Isretel's concepts of changing number of sets was like massively novel to me. It was like, what? I've never even thought about this. I just have like, a set number just like three to maybe four sets i've never really done two i've never really done more than four it was it was kind of a weird thing uh so i started trialing myself a little bit um i think actually i purchased the um, powerlifting templates that rp uh, released they're 
been out for years now. Um, the powerlifting hypertrophy templates and the strength templates and the peaking templates, like I got all of them and I just ran through it uh, just to see what it was like. And it gave me kind of a real big insight into how that programming might work um, because I read the scientific principles of strength training by Mike um, and everyone. And it's a fantastic book. I know you like it yourself, Ryan, and mm -hmm. it really it was a big help in terms of actual practical stuff for clients. Um, the stuff from Mark Repito had like lots of programs in there and I just kind of tried to draw programs from it and then like apply it to clients. It never quite worked. Whereas their book didn't have programs in there. It just had principles. And then that allowed me to actually look at programs, identify why one certain ones would work well, others not so. Um, so yeah, I saw really good results via having changing the number of sets and more than that, actually starting off mesocycles a little bit easier. Um, and this very much reminded me of doing uh, 531 by Mark Ripito. Uh, Mark Ripito by Jim Wendler, even. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so long ago. That used to be like a massive like craze. Everyone was doing it. Yep, I know uh, I did it. Yeah, I mean, I think Matt Ogus popularized it massively. That's at least where I think I heard about it. And then I ran that, and it was okay. And I think the kind of working stuff maximally and that comes a lot from powerlifting they do that a lot because they just can't train that heavy and hard all the time and that's how they actually get stronger and the same applies to get bigger and that actually really helped me have productive training again where I was feeling like actually leaving the gym like I know next week I can do a little bit more and I think that was so powerful for me and it's actually like you don't have to just go and go balls to the wall and leave everything there uh now and then that's appropriate and you really especially as you get more advanced it's something that you almost you have to do and it's something i love doing but um it took a long time for me to get used to and i'm still actually getting used to leaving kind of reps in the tank especially on some movements i get really greedy and i just want to push um and it's a constant battle to stay there and so i started applying it to clients kind of this more so leaving some reps in reserve maybe tricking up sets initially i kind of did it a bit wrong and I did it wrong with myself as well where I almost was on the in the impression like more is better I can always do more I was just like I thought I was unbreakable and oftentimes clients were the same way where they were just reporting like oh no I can definitely take more um, and it was until I kind of looked at it a bit deeper and I kind of was really honest with myself that I realized okay I'm being a bit too assertive with this I need to draw it back a little bit and I actually took um, kind of the control out of my clients' hands a little bit. I used to kind of allow them to give a rating and it would just kind of start accumulating very similar to the RP templates. And I found that people just weren't good at doing that. And so I had to, via our feedback system where we coach our clients, they give vlogs and they kind of update me talking about how their training is going. Um, and that was much better than kind of just getting them to do an objective measure because some people wouldn't fill it out. Some people didn't really understand it. Um, so it's very much kind of learning that, looking at their performance and then trickling it up and then edging on the side of less rather than more. Now that I do it with clients, like I'm very cautious about ever increasing sets. I do it. I definitely do it. But rather than it being like maybe two to four, it's more like naught to two um, on like not even all muscle groups, not not all movements. It's just kind of when we need it and when is appropriate. And if we can go for another week in the mesocycle, that's where I prefer to go rather than kind of hitting a wall early. Um, and like we've already spoken about, it's only so much volume that they can actually benefit from. It's not just more because more is better. And I've had to do that with myself. And I've realized through doing that and taking the more methodical, slower approach, not being so assertive with it, that it really differs at different times of in your environment with different clients males versus females different movements whether you're cutting or massing and it's something you have to really keep on top of and um me and uh, pascal said this ages ago that the whole volume landmarks and the concepts there i think what they are is a great kind of just idea for auto regulation of programming uh, rather than kind of like you have this is your mev this is your mrv this is where you must start and end up it's more like mm, this just a nice like okay you know you want to work within these rate like realms and kind of just go with it and see how you're feeling um trickle things up or down and this then allows you to think about things like specialization do you want to put more in one place take some away from another place so when people kind of bad mouth the concepts and kind of dispute them and kind of like how can you they're kind of 
just they are what they are they're real things just like you can have too many calories you can do too much volume there's a certain amount of calories that work for your goal there's a certain amount of volume that works for your goal um so yeah that's kind of where my coaching's evolved with myself and others and yeah i've certainly not always got it right but i'm definitely finding the more i use it the more i learn and the more i'm getting better results and uh without sounding arrogant i think the results i've got since finishing my show have really shown that because I I'm really shocked by it and it only really became real to me recently because I kind of um out of the blue Alberto Nunez kind of said how impressed he was with my transition out of my show and how all the results were coming I was like whoa that's really cool and then Mike also who hopefully I'm gonna have a consultation with soon because I just want to talk things through long term about where I want to go and he's someone I really trust um and he was like long story short for you Steve keep doing what you're doing because something's working really well so that was really nice for me to hear so yeah i think it's and same with clients like it's just evolving and things are getting better and better and um yeah it's just it's exciting because before when i didn't have this knowledge and like you're probably the same ryan you kind of felt like you just were just going along and like as long as you were kind of working hard as long as things weren't going like wrong it was right and it was kind of like, I just, I didn't even have an idea if this was an appropriate amount of volume. Um, and then you have the worm bomb step studies and all of that from Eric Helms, which is brilliant. And now more information is coming out. And I think it's more and more cementing the idea that there is an appropriate amount to be doing and there's a bell curve. Um, so yeah, it's, it's exciting stuff. Yeah, for sure. And just to clarify for everybody, when we're talking about volume, we're both kind of talking about hard sets. So sets per muscle group per week in within probably like three to five reps from failure is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about volume. And yeah, I, there's a lot of things there that I can really relate to. Like I, I know that when, when I first started, I would just always look for a program and I was looking for the program that would work for me rather than thinking about like why a program actually works and looking for different things like that. And now, now that I have that understanding, I'm like, okay, now I can just increase, decrease volume here, here and there, and kind of make these manipulations and don't have to worry about finding some like magic program, you know? So the, the kind of, the next thing that I want to move on to kind of along with this is that how, how do you decide when to, where to start with your clients or for yourself for starting a mesocycle with how much volume or where do you decide when, okay, now might be a good time to add a little bit of volume. So I guess basically the question is, when do how do you decide when to manipulate volume and things like that for clients? Cool. So this is really cool because actually um, we're now, some of my longer term clients are transitioning to being mesocycle to mesocycle clients. So they're going to have to do this for themselves. So I've been explaining that process to them and they've kind of gone through it. So they kind of have an idea of how I do it. Um, but it, it's cool because maybe I can just send them this now. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, when someone new comes to me, it's much a case of looking at, okay, have, oftentimes actually, and they can be maybe coaches themselves, maybe relatively advanced. Normally they're intermediate plus. They don't necessarily ever send me an actual program. Sometimes I get a program where it's in Excel and I can actually see the number of sets, what they've been doing over the last few months. A lot of times people just come to me and they've just got like, I don't know, a microcycle or just what they've been doing the last few weeks. And it's, it's surprising how few people are actually very structured with it. And that's the first place you want to start. It's like with a really good structure. So when I don't know their background, I can't really get an understanding of they really, really do well with higher volumes or lower volumes. Um, maybe I can talk to them about programs they've done and they can tell me whether they think they respond well to one or another. But oftentimes they don't really know. So I think the best place to start with most people and again, this actually, I think 531 and Jim Wender kind of talks about this, is talking about like starting back as a beginner. And I think that's really a great place to begin is kind of with the minimum you think that they can possibly benefit from because you can always go up. Um, you never want to start with like loads and just overkill them. Um, so it's not uncommon for me to have clients who I don't have a lot of information about them for that first week for them to report back to me that they're like, Steve, those are really easy workouts. Um, and then I like to delve a bit further into that because sometimes people and Pascal's had the same. We have clients who come to us with, who are doing massive amounts of volumes, like seven sets on every exercise and every week they're doing this. And that's the problem. It's kind of, they're not building up to this volume tolerance. They're just thinking more is better. They really struggle with scaling it back. Um, but if they trust you and luckily 
we're developing that kind of uh, notoriety and that trust with the brand and people realize we know what we're doing, that they will follow that process and then they go through it. And once they go through that process and we can't start analyzing things, we get form videos, make sure that their, their form's good, their intensity is there because sometimes those things can be missing. More so form I find than intensity. Um, I think most people who have been training a while know how to push pretty hard. Um, and more so times push too hard, I find. But technique is definitely something that can often be improved, um, especially on like certain movements is quite common. So it's kind of getting a grounding, a basis, a foundation, and starting off with the minimal that we think, and then moving forward from there. So um, something I really like that I think James and Mike have talked about for discovering kind of your minimum effective volume is thinking about kind of, was that workout tough? Kind of, and it doesn't need to be killer, it just needs to be somewhat tough. And you can almost look on paper and look at it and be like, okay, is that going to be a tough workout or not? And if it isn't tough at all, then potentially it's a bit too low. If you're getting sore at all, like any sort of feelings the next three, few days, if you feel like the next day you haven't even trained, potentially again, it could be that you need a bit more and then pumps, like if you're not getting at all pumped. Um, I don't think you have to have all three of these. I think you probably need to have one or two. And that kind of is an indicator that you're doing things right. Um, but this can also differ for like, the phase you're in, the exercises you're using. I know some exercises I could do like a couple of uh, leg extensions. I'm not going to get much from that, but two sets of squats, I'm actually going to get a fair, fair bit from that. So um, you have to take all of these things into consideration, but that's where I start. So what I find for myself as a coach with my clients is getting that MEV, getting that minimum effective volume down right, is so helpful because then I can just start a lot of mesocycles there that are hypertrophy specific and then just move forward. And then we go via, okay, Maybe you're having a tough week this week. Maybe we need to scale back. Okay, things are going really well. We're in a calorie surplus. We can push up. Um, so I really like getting that minimum effective volume. That, for me, is the most important thing to get right because we're going to hit MRV or we're going to get close at least. So that doesn't worry me that we're going to progress into it. So then when I decide about kind of whether or not we're going to add a set or not, like I said, I'm more cautious than not cautious. Um, but I tend to prioritize big compound movements first. Um, especially in the first few weeks, that seems to be really effective where they can handle some more sets there. And then whether if they're kind of topped out on the, the main compound lifts, but their accessories, you can kind of start trickling in a bit more volume there. I think that's really a, an effective approach. And like I said, I go more so on the cautious side. So if I think like they look like they can handle maybe three more sets for this muscle group, I'm going to add two. And then maybe we get to that fourth week in the mesocycle where we're thinking we're around MRV. We have a discussion of, okay, do you think you can improve performance? Do you think you can match performance for next week? You're, you're still performing really well. We haven't seen any decrements. Maybe let's try for that fifth week. And then sometimes it goes really well and then they hit MLV and they're tanked and they need a deload. Other times they do that first session of like, Steve, let's take that deload. Um, for more novice clients, I don't risk that. It's only really, I can, I'm, I, if my clients watch this, they know I do this exact chat where I'm like, do you honestly, like if I talk about a deload right now and you're like nodding your head, like, yes, that sounds good. Let's take the deload. Whereas if you're like, no way, Steve, a deload is not like in question. I can definitely go harder. Then maybe we should go harder. Um, but there's not many people that need to take that extra risk. Um, cause it's just like whether, if you think you've got one rep left, what do you really think you're going to get from that? Whereas if you risk it and you fail, you're going to get a lot of downsides potentially. So yeah, that's how I go through that system. Hopefully that was kind of well explained. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And like something that Mike will talk about a lot is kind of trying to maximize that like stimulus to fatigue ratio to where you're getting a lot of stimulus and not risking a ton and ton of fatigue. And I think that can be kind of related to taking a deload. Like you, if you progressively overload for like four or five weeks, you've gotten a lot of good stimulus throughout that like mesocycle. Is that extra week where, where you might be under a lot, a lot of fatigue really going to worth be worth that extra stimulus of just one more week? Or would it be better to just, you know, play it safe right now and, you know, cut, cut it short and deload right now. You know, I think, I think that makes, makes a lot of sense. And one thing you mentioned with with your clients is getting a lot of form videos and things like that. And that's something that, you know, I, I did not understand when I first started lifting. I did not understand the importance of like training, um, actually stimulating the muscle. I would just go in. Okay, my program says three sets of 10 for lat pull downs. I'm just going to pull the bar down instead of actually, you know, focusing on it. So I'd be curious on how you how you yourself like coach your clients up or how you do it yourself with, you know, finding that balance of getting kind of the mind muscle connection and 
feeling muscle groups versus just moving more weight? Yeah, I think it's that's a great question and it's completely true. I, I would have saved myself probably a fair amount of injuries and wasted time if I really kind of got a coach who knew how to lift. Um, all of my lifting actually has been self-taught and only like the last year maybe I've been really comfortable with like my squat I'm really happy with. Now I'm at a position where even if I haven't like conventional deadlifted for a long time, I can go into it and just do it. Um, so it's nice to be in that position, but it takes a while and it's only really, um, and I think actually my back progress has been pretty good since my show. And I think part of that is because I've actually now managing to really connect with it. Like when I do lat pull downs, I actually get a pump in my lats rather than it all going to like my biceps, my forearms. I'm like notoriously always feeling it there. Same with pull-ups. These things take a while. It's lifting is a skill uh, and it is something you develop over time. And um, I can't remember what the question was now. How do I, yeah, how, the, bal how, the balance between that and adding load. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, some people are all about, okay, let's just, if, if you get stronger, if you're moving more weight, you're going to get bigger. Whereas yeah. there's other people that are like, no, you, sh you should feel the muscle on each and every rep and you should really get a good mind-muscle connection. So, like, how, how do you feel about that? Do you think that there should be kind of, you know, a focus on lifting more weight for certain exercises and certain things like that? Or do you think that there should always kind of be that mind muscle connection there? Cool. So you kind of led me into uh, my answer actually a little bit there. Yeah. Um, so I do think, I think there is a, a fine line uh, between like mind muscle connection versus just lifting for the sake of lifting more. I think there's people that take it too far both ways. And the people that just lift to lift more end up getting way more fatigue and kind of damaging like tissue that they shouldn't be damaging and um, potentially putting themselves way at risk. And then the people that like do super slow training, like trying to absolutely feel it out, they're wasting kind of loads of mechanical tension that they could potentially be getting. So I think there's a middle ground to be met between that. But I definitely think like you were kind of alluding to, there's some exercises where focusing more on just progressively shifting more load versus kind of really feeling it um, makes sense. So something like a squat, I'm not thinking about my quads during a squat. It's just not going to happen. I'm thinking about keeping my chest up, kind of sitting nice and deep, getting a breath and not like just crushing myself under the bar. Whereas when I'm doing like a leg extension or a knee extension, if you want to get a bit pedantic, um, I really focus on feeling the quads really extending, hold that peak contraction potentially. Um, I think that's important because, yeah, there'll be people who will be doing the knee extension and like just hammering it and just like their ass is coming off the chair. Like they're, it's, they're just losing all tension in the muscle. So at the moment, I think both play a role. And I think that seems to be the nice middle ground between them. Um, but I don't, I, I think there is a fine line between like perfect form and then having good enough form, like good working form. I think you can allow yourself to go into that good working form sometimes, like just to get good work. Cause uh, I think if you are too strict with it, all the time it can hamper you a little bit and just maybe from a confidence standpoint where you're just so much like just so anal about it you never let yourself use more load or push hard and inevitably when you do go to those near failure points it, things can look a little bit less than pristine i think that's okay as long as it doesn't look horrendous <laughs> yeah i think so too there's there's always kind of like that balance there you know you, d you don't want to be like so like paralysis by analysis to where you're thinking about every little technical detail while you're performing the lift. Cause that's probably just going to decrease your performance to a level to where you're, you're not going to be able to get that mechanical tension overload like you talked about. But then again, you don't want, you don't want it to be like such bad form that you're fatiguing everything other than the muscle group you're actually trying to train. So yeah. I think, I think there's that balance there and is, is kind of the summary of, on your compound lifts, maybe you focus a little bit more on getting that mechanical tension, but making sure you use good form. And then on isolations, maybe a little bit more mind muscle connection and things like that. So that sound about right. Yeah. I think that makes sense as well from a progression standpoint, because uh, a lot of people kind of, if you jump two kilos on like a bicep curl or a dumbbell lateral raise, the reps just go, they just tank. Whereas you can add that small amount of load because it's Unfortunately, it's a small percentage to the main compound lift. So practically it also makes sense. So yeah, absolutely all with you there. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And kind of the next thing that I want to kind of move on to here is that kind of kind of a newer topic 
is resensitization phases. So kind of kind of the idea behind these is, you know, you might go through a few hypertrophy mesocycles, like high, higher volumes, working up to higher and higher volumes. And then you might take kind of a lower volume phase to kind of really drop fatigue. And I would be really interested in your experience with these, how, how you usually feel after you finish a resensitization phase, kind of if you'd want to explain how these are different than your just regular training cycles and things like that. And, you know, for me, I, I haven't got, gotten myself to actually do one of these phases yet. I'm stubborn with it. And I think that a lot of people could probably relate to that. So how do you get yourself to actually go through with one of these phases? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting because there's so much psychology involved with training and with nutrition and everything. And um, even myself, I struggle big time with going through them. And fortunately for bodybuilders, there's something that maybe you do once or twice a year, um, depending um, on things. Uh, but one, whenever I have done them, I've only ever benefited, be, benefited from it. Um, there's never been a time where I'm like, oh, I regret taking that month. Uh, and sometimes it's hard because... Um, it's kind of like taking a diet break where you take your foot off the gas and you're like, oh, but I want to keep dieting. And sometimes you don't realize the benefits you're getting from it until you're like then shredded because you took some diet breaks to alleviate some diet fatigue, just like with kind of taking a deload or taking this longer maintenance phase. You don't realize the benefits until like you're lifting when you're 40 years old and you haven't like got really bad kind of injuries and things. So I can understand that people really struggle with it. And it's kind of because bodybuilding is an interesting sport because it's it is a sport of delayed gratification like it just that is what it is like the best bodybuilders have been doing it consistently over years but there's so 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 much short-term gratification that people struggle with like doing amraps in training hitting failure every session uh, really going balls to the wall because they just want to do that and then they're fatigued really badly and they don't see the best results so i think some of the best bodybuilders are probably the really smart ones um along with the genetic freaks who can handle that crazy fatigue. Um, so you, you watch someone like Jared Feather, who I know he's out and out a meathead, but he will do things like maintenance phases. And that for me is kind of a big indication that, okay, someone that smart clued up, who also is massively jacked and kind of is a meathead, is doing them, then maybe there's, there's something to it. And then I think sometimes it's just worth trialing these things um, just like when I first got into flexible dieting, I was like slowly incorporating some junk into my diet. And I was like, this just feels wrong. I feel dirty. But I gave it a go and it, it worked tremendously well. And I think having done these, it's worked really well. So, um, yeah, I mean, for what they are, I like to rename them a bit of a primer phase because um, that is effectively what they're doing. They're trying to set you up for success going forward. And when we're talking about training and we're talking about um hypertrophy training there does become a time where it becomes a little bit stale um, accommodating resistance or kind of anabolic resistance are some terms thrown out and there is no good science on this um, there's good science on like the potential mechanistic data behind it and there's good science on like periodization being a great thing and there's some very smart people talking about potentially using these i know uh, mike obviously talks about resensitization phases i think eric uh, Brian Miner still use kind of lower volume strength phases with their um, bodybuilders. I think there's there's quite a number of kind of very educated people who are evidence based who still utilize this because it seems to make good sense in kind of a, a whole periodization concept. Um, and then when you think about kind of for me, when you do use high volumes for such a long period of time, it does become kind of very hard um, psychologically and there's nothing like taking it back for a period of time to then set you up really well coming out. And I've always felt very, very, very refreshed coming out of these periods of time, especially like from a diet, you feel completely kind of fatigue free after a whole month of kind of taking some time out. So I think there's lots of good rationale behind them. I don't think they're necessarily something you must do. Um, I don't think there's anyone who would suggest there has to be a certain length of time. Um, I think doing it from a cycle tends to make sense because who wants to do less than that? It kind of is a bit difficult. It makes sense in our calendar. Um, so the way I tend to do it is volume tends to be a it's minimum volumes, basically. So the least you need to do to retain the tissue you've got. I tend to like people to focus on other things uh, during this time. So maybe we reduce training frequency. 
which is something I think I'm going to have to do because every time I go through one of these phases and I'm doing my six days and the training sessions are so short, I'm just like, ah, I should just really do it like an upper lower four times a week or something. Um, and then that gives you more time for other things. So um, there are some stuff like for my business, for Revive Stronger, we want to write some eBooks and stuff, but I barely have time to do that at the moment. Whereas maybe during that period of time, I can do that. So it allows you to refocus on some other areas that are important in your life, which I think is a good thing just generally. Uh, but that's more of a psychological trick. Um, and on psychology, I know Mike always talks about like the best, like the best warriors kind of, they don't just work their hardest. They kind of, they do everything they're told to do. Um, and Sometimes you need someone to tell you to take these periods of time or you plan them in yourself and you follow through on your plan. Uh, and that's something I've really learned during this off season is actually like sticking to my guns because um, I've question I question myself quite a lot. And um, whenever I do that, it stresses me out. I get anxiety and like question yourself is OK. But if you've got a well thought out rationale behind your plan, stick to it. Um, I think it's going to benefit you most likely. And that's what's happened to me. So whenever I go through these phases, I end up questioning myself. I try and weasel out of it but I rationale and it just makes sense. So um, yeah, the, the training volume is reduced to about maintenance volumes, which an easy way to do that or think about it, I tend to think about it being about 60% of your minimum effective volume generally, kind of 60% of that. So it's, it's quite low, it's quite a cut, 40% less. Um, you can get away with really low volume and maintain as long as you're kind of not in a calorie deficit. I think um, James has spoken about how he's been trialing like super low maintenance volumes, like crazy low that you'd not even expect. Uh, and I think you can maintain on a lot, lot less than you realize. Uh, so yeah, it's basically scaling that back, bringing up intensity to make up for some of that volume so you can really bring volume down. I like people to focus on other areas of life, but also focus on kind of strength progression, focus on increasing load, because um, we're not going to be increasing number of sets and uh, also perfecting form. I think it's a good time just to make sure, okay, if anything was a bit kind of not where you wanted it to be, let's make sure we're doing that. So yeah, those are the kind of, that's how I set it up. Those are kind of my experiences with it. And um, I can understand why you haven't gone through one. And I think even Pascal has only done like maybe one in his um, like training career. So there's something that, yeah, not many people want to do, but when you do them, they are beneficial. Right. And, you know, they, they make a ton of sense. It's just like you said, it's that bodybuilding is a sport of delayed gratification, but there is a lot of like instant gratification mixed in with it of training to failure on sets and everything yeah. you said there. And it's just tough to be like, hey, this is just basically like a macro cycle deload. So after we've got our deload after like four weeks of training, we should probably do like a longer deload after, you know, however many months or ma macro cycles of regular productive training. And it, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's just difficult to get myself to actually do it and, and to pull the trigger on them. But the kind of next thing, kind of to go along with like the psychology of things kind of being difficult is sometimes the, the scale weight just doesn't play ball. And I would be interested in your experience or what things that you try to do to not focus so much on the scale, but to mil still make sure that you're, you're making progress. Cause I know I'm pretty sure you're, you're kind of going through a mini cut and the scale didn't quite play ball right away when you started. So would you like to kind of speak to that a little bit? hundred percent. Um, I think it, the scale is something that so many people confuse and get really emotionally attached to. And I think they end up hating it. And what we must realize is the scale only weighs you. It only tells you how much you weigh. It can't tell you how you should feel about yourself. It can't tell you if you've lost fat or not. It can't tell you if you've gained muscle or not. It can only tell you exactly what you weigh at that period of time. So it's taking that for what it is. And it's important, I think, first of all, to realize that, um, because it can't tell you everything, it can't tell you whether you've gained muscle, it can't tell you whether you've lost fat, you need to have other datas um, or data points rather. So you want to have kind of gym performance, you want to have um, su circumference measurements, potentially photos, I think are very, very useful, even small things like, okay, how's your belt fitting? Um, how are your clothes fitting? These can be really cool. Uh, and just like even for myself recently, I was kind of like, washing and I was just like oh I can't normally feel my lat when I do this that's quite cool I can feel my lat now so then you just notice things are changing you have to take all of this into combination with one another because um, the scale 
And water weight is the biggest issue there because so many things impact that. Um, so many people weigh themselves in cor- incorrectly, first of all. So um, you've got to be sure that you're doing it in a consistent manner where you're getting good data. So that's like the same time most days, before or after the loo, depending how you do that. Uh, and then without clothes or the same amount of clothes each time, taking it and then working out an average for the week and then looking at the time course is a week appropriate to your goal should you be seeing a change in a week maybe you look at two week averages if you're trying to gain weight maybe that's more appropriate females have to then consider their kind of menstrual cycle within that which can fluctuate the scale by like seven pounds potentially i've seen some wacky things there Um, and then an example of just how crazy this sort of thing can be is i Deloaded, I went on holiday. I stopped creatine, my carbohydrates came down massively. My sodium intake probably was massively dropped as well uh, because I salt a lot when I'm back home. And then my first week back, I basically lost five pounds. And I was like, right, I reckon if I was to go back to my usual eating, I'd gain that five pounds back. But I continued to mini cut as soon as I got back. So I effectively think I ended up kind of losing five pounds from the mini cut, but then gaining five pounds through reincorporating creatine, higher sodium, um, and reincorporating training, having some soreness there. So my scale weight effectively told me that I maintained. But according to my kind of um, calorie intake, thermodynamics, I was in a thousand calorie deficit. So I know good and well I didn't maintain weight. And when I look in the mirror, I think about how hungry I was. Um, and all of those sort of d- other data points, I know I've lost some f- like fat that week, or I've at least lost weight. I've lost a lot of glycogen. Um, and then this next week, like you said, scale weight hasn't moved much. I've actually dropped, I think, a pound, which I was even surprised about um, having collected and then averaged out my data. I've lost a pound, but I imagine it's more than that. Um, it's just there's other things that are going on. And um, I think it's really individual because I've had clients who will go through a cut and they're not very, very lean. They should be losing weight. Like there's no reasons. It should just be falling off. Um, and they're telling me they're adherent. There's no reason to believe that they're not. But the f- like they won't lose any weight that month. And it could be that maybe they've increased their sodium intake. Maybe they've increased their fiber intake. Um, maybe they've just something's changed. They've had more stress. And then okay, the next month they see a huge drop on the scale, like consistently every single week, they're seeing like two pounds drop. It's, it's, it's a strange, strange thing. And I think there's some people just react differently. Um, some people are very consistent on the scale. And the more people I've worked with, the more I've had to go into trusting the process. Um, and as long as we have good data in the past of what calories they gain on, what calories they maintain on, uh, as long as I know they're being adherent, they know how to track their macros accurately, they're doing their training, they're doing their cardio, if we're in a decent deficit, which I basically always put them in a, a fairly decent deficit, and they're reporting that they're being all of those things and probably maybe a bit hungry as well, then I know things are going, we just, that scale just isn't playing ball right now. Um, and oftentimes, you can even have things like people will recomp, especially if actually a really good, nice thing out of a primer phase or the low volume phase is you come out and you start training with higher volumes again. And even if you go into a cut, you can sometimes actually gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. And I'm pretty sure that happened during my contest prep because I had weeks on weeks on weeks where my scale weight was the same, but I was looking leaner and leaner and leaner. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so yeah, the scale is a bit of a mind fuck for people and I can understand why people want to throw it out and not use it. And I can see that being appropriate in some cases, but it is a really helpful tool because overall long-term, if you're not a newbie, if you've, got a decent amount of weight to lose like the scale is going to come down um it's just the short term where it might not and that could scupper your progress if you get too kind of concerned about it yeah totally agree and i think that especially in in a fat loss phase like it's i like to look for kind of that that nice balance between being being a little bit hungry but not being like crazy hungry because at some point, like if, if you're dieting, that's your body's way of telling you that you're probably in a calorie deficit. And I think that's a pretty good indicator that things are probably heading in the right direction, even if scale weight's not playing ball and you're probably seeing like your waist circumference go down and things like that. So I think those are some some really great things there. And during during a massing phase, do you do you just kind of zoom out a little bit farther with the scale weight, you know, maybe look at monthly averages instead, just because 
at least for for myself and people I've worked with, it's a little bit more difficult to tell in in a massing phase just because scale weight might not move for a couple of weeks and then it might all of a sudden bounce by three or four pounds in a week. So are there specific things you're looking for d- during a massing phase to be like, okay, w- we're still probably making progress here, even if the scale weight's not going up like week to week? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a really tri- tricky one. And I've kind of changed my perspective on it because I used to, and I think wrongly, and I don't think many people suggest this, try and gain it like the re- rate limiting gain of muscle. So that's like trying to gain that one pound of muscle that maybe a more advanced trainee might be able to gain. So I'd literally try and gain that pound in a month. And with all the fluctuations that go on during the weeks, it can be really difficult to know whether you've actually gained that pound. So by being a little bit more assertive, I tend to get more consistent weekly increases. But I've certainly had clients where, and in fact, I've got a client and neither of us know why this happens. He tends to get more hungry when he's in a surplus. And he have like weeks where his weight will go up like two pounds and then it will go up two pounds. And then the next week we'll be like, oh, should we lower calories? Because this is very quick. He lose like four pounds. And it's like every month this tends to happen. So the more data you collect, and again, this is why I think trusting in having good data beforehand, knowing about where your maintenance is, having that kind of um, accuracy and adherence to your calories allows you to trust that you're doing it right. I mean, again, this is where other data sets come in because I've had clients where they're like, Steve, I know that the, the scale weight's going up really quick, but I'm confident that I'm looking so, like I'm not like gaining loads of fat. Performance is really good. I'm feeling good. I think there's something else that's funny there. Um, so this is why it's really helpful to talk it through. And this is something I've had to do for myself is really take a step back away from the scale and just kind of see if it's trickling up, it's trickling up. And I don't try and focus on it too, too much. And normally you can kind of get a good inkling whether or not you're in a surplus, but I've spent far too long in my training career where I have just maintained and it's frustrated the hell out of me because once you reach a point you're not going to be gaining muscle whilst you're maintaining weight you need to be in that surplus because um an analogy I absolutely love is gaining muscles like cycling uphill whereas losing fats like cycling downhill at least in theory um obviously some people argue being in a mass phase is easy, but actually gaining muscles far di- more difficult than losing fat is on a physiological basis. So why make it any harder? Put yourself in a surplus. And I'm not saying people should kind of go crazy with it, but if you're putting yourself into a 300 calorie surplus, it's tend to be like my kind of average, I guess, where I put people, I think that's a good starting point. But like you said, some people, it's weird, like there's a growth spurt or something, but generally I'm looking for more consistent, like bi-weekly, um, there should be something going up and if they're not and it kind of makes sense to me that they should be having more then I'll give them more but I've certainly had and it's a lot of the time females we get them training really well we get them really consistent and their scale weight will actually kind of just maintain but they end up kind of recomping and it's kind of a crazy thing I think um, there's there's so many things to have to think about and I wish I could give a more conclusive and solid objective answer for people, but there just isn't. And I think that's why having coaching is so valuable for some people because they get so caught up in it all. Yeah, for sure. There's, it's, there's rarely going to be like hard lines in a lot of this stuff. It's all going to be, you know, different like shades of gray to where you're not, we we think things are headed in the right direction, but like, it's going to be tough to say for sure. And just because this one thing's happening doesn't mean that, you know, things are for sure going the way we want or not going the way we want. So I think that's really good there. And your your point on, you know, being a little bit more assertive, I know that's something that really helped me out a lot because there's, there was like, I went like a year without like dieting or anything. And I thought, Hey, that's a great job. I gained like four pounds. And I was just like, dude, you you probably didn't gain like any, any tissue at all. You probably just filled out like glycogen levels and then didn't do anything because yeah, I think that getting, I think a balance is probably good there too, where you're, you're not shooting for that, that super like six, seven pounds a month. That's probably a bit, a bit crazy, but you're also not shooting for that, like a quarter of a pound or something like that, just because then you run in the issues where you can't even track that accurately, you know? So you, you recently went on a bit of a holiday. So I was just curious on my mic doesn't fall down on me here. Yeah. I'm just curious on how you kind of try to manage holidays. If, if you 
maybe plan a deload for those types of things or what what you like do with your calories. I know some people get like really worried about hitting yeah. calories on holidays and I I know for myself personally like I've gone to different like family events in the past and kind of really worried about hitting macros and stuff like that. So kind of what what are your typical recommendations for yourself or clients for what how you handle those situations? So yeah, with um with training wise if it can be a deload i like that um if it can't if we can make it not kind of in the middle of a mesocycle it's kind of helpful uh, i've recently for my holiday i did like an active recovery week which is basically like i trained once when i was out there did some body weight stuff whilst i was out there um it was more of a psychological difficult thing not training than like anything else but when you're busy and doing things it's quite easy to do that and in one week you're not losing anything and in some ways, it was nice not to be going into a holiday so fatigued. Um, I'm less and less of favor of going into holidays, especially dieting hard. I think that's a good way to set yourself up for failure. I think it, if you can at least deload, go to like a maintenance intake and then go on holiday, I think you're going to be feeling much, much better, or at least reduce the deficit going into it. Because I see a lot of people um, do the kind of trick of thinking, oh, if I save loads of calories this week, I can then go on holiday and like not worry about it. And they just end up binging every day. It's so easy to overeat um, on holiday, especially. Um, but yeah, with clients and I'm not as, well, actually, you know, my recommendation to clients is the same as what I give to myself. But I think some of my clients are better at doing it than me. I wish I could be better at it because I'm not very good at switching off. Um, but I tend to recommend like what's, going to give you the least stressful kind of um, and the most enjoyable holiday because that's what we want it to be. We want it to be low stress. I want you to go and enjoy it. Right now, there's nothing you need to do if you're not in comp prep. There's nothing nutritionally you need to do that's particularly clever. I'm always going to recommend taking like whey protein with them, protein bars. These are like really helpful um, having those in the with you because that alleviates some stress because I think we all stress when we can't get our protein in. So that is really helpful. But then the rest of the time, it's kind of like if you want to guesstimate if you want to have a certain idea of how, about how many calories you're eating then do that and some clients would prefer to do that and know they're not under eating or eating excessively and they don't need to know exactly they just kind of guesstimate they just have somewhat of an idea and that's what I tend to do I kind of keep the habit of logging in and going in there and I'm just like right what did I eat oh yeah I'll just put that in just so I know I'm in a ballpark um, because I think especially I don't know, I just get quite anxious myself about it. And so it helps me not actually think about it. Whereas if I didn't do any of that, I'd kind of be thinking, oh, what did I eat then? Can I eat this? And I try and do the math in my head. I think that would stress me out more. Whereas some clients, they can just go away and I can just be like, right, just think about having high protein. You're going to keep active. Like we're all, we all have that kind of lifestyle ingrained in our head when we're thinking steps, where we're thinking kind of like we need to get some fruit and veggies in or something. And it's very rare to get a client who will go away on holiday and just like binge their face off. It's just not likely to happen. So basically what I try and recommend to myself and to clients is do what's going to allow you to have the least stress and the most enjoyment. And, and sometimes that can actually change within the holiday itself. Sometimes at the start, they're thinking, oh, yeah, I guesstimating makes me feel really d distressed. And after a while, as they get into the holiday, they end up tracking less. So maybe they don't even track the last four days. Uh, so I, I, that's my tends to be my approach, because whilst everyone, I think, has the idealistic idea of just intuitively go and eat or do that, I think that can stress a lot of individuals out, especially like bodybuilder types. Yeah, for sure. And I, I kind of go back and forth on this in my own head. Like sometimes I think that I would just be a lot, lot less stress free if I just kind of had protein at every meal and just kind of tried to like eat like an adult, you know, and yeah. try to kind of intuitively do it, you know, not not get crazy, but be kind of normal about it. And then sometimes I'm like, man, I, I actually that might cause me to think about things more, and it might be better if I do guesstimate. So I go back and forth on it, but yeah, I think that. Depending on the scenario, it's just going to depend on what might lead to less stress for you. And I, I really like your point on that. It's probably not the best idea to like diet into an event like this or save up tons and tons of calories because I think that just sets you up for like a binge mentality and thing, things are just going to be a lot worse than if you kind of go into it somewhat satiated and you're feeling pretty good. So the very last question I have for you here, Steve, is that, you know, for myself personally, this whole lifting thing has had a lot of positive benefits on my life. I know it's helped me 
school a ton. It's helped me try and try to get my own business going, doing this podcast. It's given me the confidence to do some of these things. So I'm just wondering if you have any like specific things in your life that you can say, man, lifting weights really helped me out in this other area of my life. Cool. Well, that's really good to hear um, because it's funny. I literally did a post today on my Instagram talking about how kind of, in my opinion, at least like the whole fitness thing, whatever you're doing should complement what you're doing in life. And um, I really struggle for anyone to have an argument outside of that where like it is their life. Um, I think even if it's something that makes you money, it should still complement the rest of what you're doing. So um, that's really positive to hear from you. And for me, um, the, the biggest thing it's helped me with was after my accident, it was the fact that I no longer really had much confidence kind of in running. I felt quite isolated myself and it was a way to build myself back up, um, both physically and mentally, because if I was physically strong, that made me a little bit more mentally tough as well. And it's allowed me to find other people who are very similar natured to me. And it's used some of my personality traits and put them to good use. So kind of that obsessiveness, that consistency, that kind of hard working mentality, which are traits that are required to be a good bodybuilder. They're things I just have. Um, but I, I do think the focus on eating well, the focus on um, kind of gaining muscle helped me get over my accident um, where I could have been dug into quite a deep hole, I think potentially. So that has had a huge dramatic impact on me. And then again, obviously, now sitting here on your podcast um and like it's it's amazing to have got into a position where i can interview kind of the, some of the world's experts and help thousands of people i the, the fact that i get messages probably on a daily basis where people are like thanking the podcast thanking the information that's put out clients kind of getting great results it's unbelievable um yeah it, it's been a massively positive impact on me love it i i think that you know just lifting and having some some sort of thing like that in your life can benefit so many other areas. And it's so much more than just building muscle, losing fat, and looking better. You know, of course, that's that's an awesome byproduct. It's awesome to be able to flex your guns every once in a while. That's cool. But these other life benefits is just as important in my opinion. So Steve, thank you so much. Where, where can people find you? Where, where would you like to send people after this podcast? Yeah, thank you for having me on. Absolutely appreciate it. I think people would be silly not to join our Facebook group. And I'll say R because Ryan is a moderator over on there. He helps us out big time um, and answers questions in there as well. Um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd love people to join that Facebook group if they do want that sort of community. And then the Revive Stronger website has like some old blogs on there, the podcast on there. Um, and Revive Stronger anywhere, but if they want to kind of contact me personally, probably best is Instagram. Um, I do a lot of stuff over there. I really enjoy that platform. So yeah, people can find me there. Yeah, and I'll I'll piggy on, piggy I'll piggyback on that and say the Revive Stronger Facebook group is crazy, crazy great place for you know it's basically a nice discussion board of any questions that you have. You'll have Pascal, Steve, Miguel will answer questions as well in there. A lot of guys that know a lot of stuff will have nice discussions in there. So I couldn't recommend that more, but that's all we have for today. Thanks you so much for coming on, Steve. Thank you a lot for having me. Cheers, guys. And that was today's school muscle episode. I, I really hope you guys enjoy that. Steve really knows what he's talking about, has tons of experience. And if you can just take a few things away from this episode, I think you can really benefit from doing so. But thank you so much for tuning in. It would really mean the world to me if you would go leave a review, drop a comment on this video if you're watching on YouTube, and give me some feedback on how you like these videos and things like that. And oh yeah, Make sure to join that Revive Stronger Facebook group and go check out Steve because that dude is helping a lot of people out. But thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you in that next episode.